guys, I'm Rizvik, if you all know me. Uh, and this is my clinical pros exam, or test presentation. So we'll start with a case. There's a 46-year-old gentleman with a history of diabetes, hypertension, he's coming in with dizziness since yesterday morning. Okay. It's been progressive, but it's never really abated. He notices that when he moves his head, it feels worse, but never fully goes away. Um, there's some nausea, he's had a couple of episodes of vomiting, and he feels like the room is spinning rather than feels like things go black when he stands up. And he feels unsteady when he walks. Last week he had a URI with a fever that's been resolving, and he hasn't struck his head, hasn't had any trauma, and hasn't been taking any medications. So, objectives of my presentation. I'm gonna go over the HINS exam. And um, that stands for head impulse, nystagmus, and testis skew. That's a good way to remember it, but it's not really the way that you do the exam itself. And then we'll go over the indications for what it actually was tested on, um, what's the utility, and the steps to doing the exam. So before we do that, we'll go into vertigo, which is, you know, I think yesterday at County, I was working with Friday, and there was a whole bunch of people <coughs> came in with vertigo or dizziness, and it's like, what's causing that? So there's so many possibilities. Um, this is just a few. I pulled up this table from up to date. But vertigo is defined as the pathologic illusion of movement and just the physiology of it. There's the bilateral vestibular labyrinths. There's afferent signaling um, via the vestibular portion of eighth cranial nerve that goes to the vestibular nuclei. And then there's signaling from there to the cerebellum. Then you have comparison between each side, right versus left. And then efferent signaling to the ocular motor nuclei and to the spinal cord. So that's kind of how the vestibular <coughs> ocular reflex works. And then with peripheral causes, you'll have the imbalance. It arises from some sort of dysfunction with the labyrinths or with the eighth cranial nerve. And when examining the patient, you'll see that the nystagmus tends to be horizontal and unidirectional. So it doesn't change direction depending on which direction the patient may be looking. With central causes for vertigo, <coughs> the lesion is more involving the brainstem or the cerebellum. And you can have vertical, torsional, or horizontal nystagmus, and it can be bidirectional. So it changes direction depending on which side the patient's looking at. So I don't know if you guys were looking at emails a little bit last year. There was a little chain between Dr. Z and Dr. Catpay talking about the HITS exam and its utility in the emergency department. When the initial study came out in 2009, it was referring to specific conditions called acute vestibular syndrome rather than just all types of vertigo. And acute vestibular syndrome is defined as acute onset, continuous dizziness, uh, vertigo, ataxia. It can last from days to weeks, never really resolves. There can be nausea and vomiting. There's discomfort with head motion, and there's nystagmus. And then, you have peripheral causes, most common peripheral causes for that are labyrinthitis, vestibular neuritis, mastoiditis, uh, and then central causes will involve things like the uh, posterior circulation, so you can have a stroke involving the posterior circulation, multiple sclerosis, there can be Wernicke's encephalopathy. So how do you do it? First thing you need to have your patient sitting, facing towards you. And then the order in which you actually do it, it's not the same as the mnemonic. You want to do the test for nystagmus first. So you have the patient sitting in front of you, facing towards you. And you look at extremes of gaze, slow and then fast. And you're assessing for change in direction depending on when they're looking to the right or to the left. Then with the test of skew, that's the next step, you cover one eye, again, they're looking towards you, cover one eye, and see if there's refixation when you uncover that eye, and do it with both sides. And then finally, the head impulse. Uh, I'm gonna show you guys a video of it being done. Yeah? Just wanna point out that it's not uncommon to have like end gaze in stagnus for a few beats on each side. So if you see it, it doesn't necessarily mean something's wrong. 
A lot of people have it just when they look all the way from one side. <coughs> Thanks. Um, then with the head impulse, they're again facing towards you. They're actually looking at you, and you turn the head first slowly, uh, 20 degrees away from the midline, both sides, and then quickly. Um, and you want to do it in such a way that they can't actually predict which direction they're going to go. And again, it's not the same as the mnemonic. And I'm going to try to pull up this video. So this is actually the human token doing. Okay, I'm not sure how to sound. But uh, when you're just looking at this, when he does the test of skew, he is not positioned directly. It is from the camera's perspective, so you don't have full coverage of the eyes uh, from camera's perspective. But first thing he's going to do is he's going to do the head impulse. So the patient is looking directly towards him. And he's going to turn it both sides, 20 degrees from midline at the extreme. And he's going to start slow. And then move fast. So like she can't predict which way he's gonna go. What's that? This looks like performance art. <laughs> I don't know how to turn it off. <laughs> so next he's gonna do nystagmus, so he's gonna look at extremes of gaze. First is going slowly and then quickly. So initially you do it without stopping in the extremes and just yeah, and then finally you go to the extremes, and you're looking for a beating that changes directions at each of the extremes. Now he's going to do test of skew, so like I said, he's not fully covering up the eye because from his perspective, perspective it's covered, but from the cameras it's not. So he's looking for refixation, vertical movement of the eye when it's uncovered. With uh, like I'd always been taught that vertical nystagmus was like indicative of posterior pathology, uh, or central pathology, and but it's not really a part of this exam. Do you know why that might be or the it's, it wasn't one of the things that was tested, um, at least in the It some. wasn't one of the things that was tested, but it was noted that if you do see that, that's... That's suggestive. That's suggestive central mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it's in a HITS exam, and mm -hmm. it's not. It wasn't one of the things that was tested. So how do you interpret it? Um, this was a nice table I found. So with a peripheral cause for the vertigo, you will see when doing the actual head impulse test, you'll see corrective saccade. Nystagmus will be uh, unidirectional, and you won't see any movement of either eye when doing the test of skew. 
if you see any other combination that should raise suspicion for a central cause for the person's vertigo. And then this was a um, mnemonic that one of Newman Tucker's papers had, infarct, and that stands for impulse normal or fast phase alternating or refixation on cover test. So if you see any of those things, that should raise suspicion for a uh, central etiology for the patient's vertigo. But it's really limited because when the study itself was done, it was done by neuro-ophthalmologists, neuro-ophthalmologists, uh, the population was not really in the emergency department, it was more in outpatient population. <coughs> and the study population was also fairly small. Uh, I think in the paper in 2009, it was like 50 patients, or 300 patients or so. Um, I don't remember the exact number. So summary, um, just understand that the HITS exam have some idea of what it is. <coughs> it's really only been tested for acute vestibular syndrome. It's not really useful for all kinds of all types of vertigo. And depending on what you look at, what sorts you look at, um, different people will say different things as to its utility. Uh, on EM crit, Weingart talks about using it as just a way when he has very low suspicion for a patient, using it as like a final confirmatory step before sending them home. If someone is actually suspecting posterior circulation stroke, even without the HINTS exam, he's going to spin them, scan them, and consult neurology. And then just remember the technique. The order of operations is not the same as the mnemonic. So it's nystagmus, then test of skew, and then head impulse, and then the HINTS to infarct. So impulse normal, um, fast phase alternating, refixation of cover test, and just the limitations. It's not really been studied in an ER population. I think it's something that's fairly easy to do. It doesn't cause any harm. It's not invasive, but it definitely needs more of a study. So I want to thank Drs. Ocasio, Sterling, and Moran, and then for helping me with the presentation, and then Dr. Zitabchi and Kat Bay for that discussion in November. And here are my sources. So that video they did it backwards then? The video he did it in a way different order. Than I cut it in half, so I did like okay. the first half of it, he does it in the order that he normally would do it, but he's kind of face it's from the okay. side rather than from directly in front of the patient. Can you go back to the interpretation slide? So something that was confusing for me was the head impulse and normal and normal thing. He has said peripheral. If they correct the fixation, when you turn your head, it's basically, uh, if they do correct, it's peripheral. So you do want them to correct. Mm -hmm. If it's abnormal, it means it's central, they don't correct it. They can't fix a new when you turn the head. However, if you do it on a normal person, they normally can't fix it. So it doesn't mean all of us right now here are having a central stroke because no, we no, can't no. fix it. We need to do it only, it means, in the patient who has vertigo right now, not episodic. Yeah. And that's, that's actually really important because it's only been tested for acute vestibular syndrome, and those aren't patients who have vertigo that comes and goes. They have had continuous vertigo that hasn't really abated. It might be worse with some head positions, but it's never really gone away. Yeah. So the patient should have vertigo right now in front of you. Yeah. Another thing is they actually did study this yeah. in the ED population, I think in 2012. Okay. Um, the, another problem is that this was also <coughs> neuro-ophthalmologist, ophthalmologist, and one EP with uh, fellowship training in neurovascular stuff. So, and they all received like four hours of training prior to doing this. So the issue is, you know, for us to use this in the ED, it's not really appropriate. Um, like we can't say, oh, it's negative, you know, we can uh, safely rule out stroke, unfortunately. So until they, give a nice study showing it in, done by EPs in the ED, then we can't really use this to realize. It's not, it, you can't use it to, yeah. But it's really important to mention because it's the, it's not the yeah. Dr. Fogel. Yeah, extrapolation is nice, especially for something new. Um, but, you know, I don't know if you came across it or you suddenly touched on it, like when you said what would Weinstock do. Um, do you want to discuss how good HINTS is when it was kind of proven that this is something that might be 
viable to use? The initial study, if I remember right, the sensitivity was like was comparable to a diffusion weighted MRI after 48 hours. Which yeah, is which is awesome, right? Awesome. Like we've got a physical exam test that is comparable and may even beat the MRI. The difficult thing is what's the gold standard if it beats the MRI. But, um, I mean, I think that's you know always impressive, and then we kind of slice it out like you, you can't extrapolate it. But I mean. And then you got to get an external validation. But I mean, right now, like, pretty good, pretty cool. I don't know if we have any tests of these. It's not difficult because it's hard to reproduce. And they did it under video. So if you can do it with video, it's great. But it's hard to reproduce and see it. They said neurologists have trouble doing it. So I think that our single might be able to do it as well. Which means we would be better. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I think with other things, too, like that, if the patient can walk, I mean, that could make a difference, too. And we actually had a gentleman, a young guy actually, with the same symptoms essentially. Um, he couldn't really do hence testing or dick swap pipe or anything because he couldn't tolerate it. But the fact that he just could not walk, he said that if he stood up, he was just going to fall essentially. Uh, we had been in for that and he ended up having a cerebellum uh, stroke right here. So but just that, if they can't walk in addition to abnormalities, um, it's likely central. And when you do the nystagmus, one, one thing again is <clears throat> when you start off and you're doing your initial, uh, if you see obviously vertical nystagmus, mostly you're going to see, like you mentioned, horizontal and rotary. If you see vertical at all, that's almost always neurological sen central disease, whether it's from <clears throat> a stroke or a toxin like PCP, angel dust, also, but I've seen that a lot of times. 